This is WNCT 9 on your side, News at 6. Well, it was a hot, muggy day of weather that led to a lot of instability and some big, in some cases, severe thunderstorms have fired up this afternoon. Currently, a severe thunderstorm warning still in effect for Nash County and extreme eastern Halifax County. That storm's getting set to push now into Martin and Bertie County. So if you're watching us from anywhere from Windsor down south and west towards Hamilton, some heavy rain could be headed your way. A lot of hail with some of these storms at times today. Certainly not the only pocket out there. Elsewhere, showers and storms across Duplin County and a thunderstorm. Storm has just been sitting on the Onslow Jones County line, dumping torrential rain here. Up in a few minutes, we'll talk about the showers and thunderstorms tonight and the potential for even more strong and severe thunderstorms tomorrow with a first alert weather day that will continue through Friday evening. The longest running newscast in the East starts now. An Eastern North Carolina man is free this evening after spending 25 years behind bars. It comes after prosecutors said they didn't want to move forward with a new trial in the case of Dante Sharp. Good evening. I'm Shayla Reed. And I'm Ken Watling. Sharp was originally convicted in the 1994 murder of George Radcliffe. Not your sides. Aaron Dean was in the courtroom today when Sharp learned that he would be a free man. Aaron joins us now with more. Dante Sharp's family, friends, and supporters are celebrating what they call justice. After his second evidentiary hearing today, the man who has been served, who has been in prison for 25 years, is now free. And what you're seeing right now is reaction in the courtroom from his family and friends when they got the news that he will be coming home. And earlier today, two people took the stand during today's hearing. One being Charlene Johnson Frazier, who testified during Sharp's original trial when she was just 14 years old. Today, she reaffirmed to the court that she did not tell the truth during that 1995 trial. At the time, she was young and what she calls an out-of-control kid. Then the court heard from a lawyer who put into context what it was like to be a lawyer in the 1990s. After recess, the judge ruled that with the new evidence, it can be used in a new trial. That's when the DA's office said that they will, that they will not retry this case. Sharp was then released from prison on a $100,000 unsecured bond. I think that today was not a test of Dante's character or Dante's integrity. It was a test of the integrity of the court system. And what we saw was the courts doing exactly what the law is supposed to do, which is to seek justice, to seek the truth, and to make right wrongs, even when it's hard to acknowledge them. Once Sharp was freed, a prayer was held outside of the courthouse. Sharp nor his family members spoke to the media after court today because they were just ready to get home and spend some much needed time with each other. And tomorrow there will be a celebration for Dante Sharp's release at the Philippi Church of Christ in Greenville from far, from four to seven. Live in Greenville, Aaron Dean, now on your side. Aaron, thanks. According to the North Carolina Innocence Project, any person proven innocent is eligible for exoneree compensation for their time served. A person can receive $50,000 for each year of incarceration, up to a maximum of $750,000. The compensation includes providing job skills, training, and education tuition waivers. Tracking crime now, we're learning more about a deadly shooting that happened on Wednesday night. A family member has identified the victim as 25-year-old Shakur Hedgepath. Our Madison Forsey has the latest tonight from Plymouth. Ken, Shayla, tonight we're learning new information about a shots fired call that was made last night in Plymouth where a man was shot and killed. Family members have identified the victim as Shakur Hedgebeth. They say he just celebrated his 25th birthday yesterday. The shooting happened near the intersection of Wilson and West 4th Street. Family that lives around the area tells me last night around 845 they heard what sounded like fireworks and it turned out to be gunshots. According to the Plymouth Police Department, this is an active investigation, and earlier today we watched law enforcement canvas the scene. The town of Plymouth is also working with the State Bureau of Investigation to try and solve the case. Town officials tell me that tragic incidents like this don't happen often in Plymouth. Please come forward and uh, give any type of information that you might have. Uh, even if you don't think that it is pertinent, uh, may not contribute. Um, the public does not necessarily know what the police department is looking for with uh, for background information, backup information, uh, or any uh, information that might reinforce something that the police department is working on currently to solve this heinous crime. If you have any information on this case, you can call the Plymouth Police Department, and as always, we'll continue to monitor the situation and bring you updates as we get them. In Plymouth, Madison 4C, 9 on your side. 
Authorities are still searching for the suspect in a deadly Jacksonville shooting. It happened at 7:30 Wednesday morning in the 1200 block of Davis Street. Deshaun Pearsall was found suffering from gunshot wounds on the street. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Tyquan Hayes is considered a person of interest. One neighbor says she didn't hear any gunshots, but witnessed law enforcement responding to the scene. I was getting ready to get my daughter ready for school, then I looked outside and I seen all the all the police and I seen, you know, the body on the ground, so I was just the suspect is considered armed and dangerous. A cash reward of $5,000 is being offered to anyone with information. If you have information, you can contact Crime Stoppers. Police in Rocky Mount are investigating after a shooting that led to a victim dying at a hospital. It happened this morning just before 7:30 on Nancy Circle. Officers found an unresponsive 26-year-old man at the scene. He was taken to Nash UNC Healthcare where he died from his injuries. Police are currently investigating leads in connection with this shooting. If you have any information, contact Rocky Mount Police. A man is charged in connection to a weekend shooting that left a man hospitalized in Aden. Multiple agencies were involved in the arrest. Aden police say 50 year old Milton Ray German was involved in a fight with his girlfriend's brother when he shot him. The victim was taken to Vita Medical Center in Greenville for treatment. German is being held in the Pitt County Detention Center under a $2 million bond. A ceremony in Jacksonville today remembered the history and accomplishments of the Montford Point Marines. The Jacksonville community revisits the Montford Point Memorial to remember the sacrifice African American Marines made. Nine of your sides, Camila Barco has the story. 20,000 gold stars, each representing a Montfort Point Marine that served during World War II. We came, we saw, and we conquered. John Spencer was one of thousands of recruits to receive training at the Montfort Point camp in the 1940s, now known as Camp Johnson. We went through a lot of trials and tribulations, but it made better men out of us. At a time of segregation, African Americans were not sent to traditional boot camps. We, we were American citizens, but we were African Americans. The veteran recalls the challenges and color barriers Montford Point Marines faced. We couldn't walk the streets, and we couldn't uh, be on this side of the railroad. But Spencer's efforts paved the way for many, including retired colonel for the U.S. Marine Corps, Grover Lewis III. I had the distinction of being the first African American CEO of that camp during that time period. A change Lewis III credits the Montfort Point Marines. Help skyrocket uh, uh, things in other areas. President Harry Truman signed an executive order desegregating the United States Armed Forces in July 1948. A year later, Montfort Marine Camp was deactivated. That history is, is something that can't be lost. An end to segregation on base and an opportunity for African Americans to move forward. Change from we don't want you, we don't need you, till you are a part of us and you always will be. In Jacksonville, Camila Barco, Nine on Your Side. Army officials are warning the public about upcoming military activities scheduled for the next few weeks. The training will be staged across 21 counties from August 30th to September 12th. The exercises are known as Robin Sage training. The Army says it resembles extreme role playing where trainees may fire blanks and engage with Fort Bragg soldiers acting as guerrilla fighters. It's been nearly two months since Governor Cooper vetoed the state budget, and it seems like there's still no compromise in the works. The sticking points remain teacher pay and expanding Medicaid. WNCT's Dylan Hoffman has been following this budget battle since June, and now teachers are back in the classroom, and school is about to begin for many in our state. Yeah, guys, there's a lot in both versions of the budget for teachers, the Democratic and the Republican version, but Medicaid seems to be what is holding everything up. We're in a budget impasse right now. The governor has, to me, great plans, uh, a better budget. When it comes to moving forward, lawmakers are still at odds. When the teachers start coming into school and receiving their um, pay stubs and checks, they're going to realize that the raises that they've earned are not there. Teacher pay right now stays the same. Republicans and Democrats both agree more needs to be done to help teachers in the classroom. This includes more money for school construction and school safety. Districts need more money to add resource officers, pay for supplies, and help with school lunches. We were able to fund a lot of those through the budget because of the stalemate. Uh, that's where we're at. 95% of the budget 
is agreed upon. It's just these few things. Among them, teachers pay. The legislature's budget right now has teachers earning a 3.9 pay raise over the next two years. The governor wants to see an 8.5% raise. Let's pay our teachers more. Let's invest in our public schools. We, we have the money available to do it. Expanding Medicaid is the other main issue holding up progress. The governor won't sign a budget without it. The governor put out a proposal. He compromised on some things and said, Here's my counter proposal. No response. Many Republicans say, let's pass the budget, then discuss Medicaid. I have a hard time to know what Medicaid has to do with road construction, what um, Medicaid has to do with school construction dollars and school safety dollars. We just believe there's a different way to handle that. Democratic Representative Ager says he doesn't think the Republicans will ever get enough votes to override the veto, so he says it's time to start negotiating. Republican Representative Bell says they are starting next week. Republicans will start to sit down and talk about passing certain sections of the budget. He says they're able to do that to hopefully get some progress made without passing the full budget. We'll keep you updated on any progress. Live in the studio, Dylan Huffman, 9 on your side. Started out the day with a lot of sunshine and heat that has led to high instability and the thunderstorms are blossoming. We'll show you which counties are currently under warnings. We'll also look ahead to the upcoming weekend and check in on the tropics. This is your WNCT 9 first alert weather. We have almost made it to the weekend and believe it or not, tomorrow night, our first edition of Touchdown Friday. Of course, our game of the week tomorrow evening is Jacksonville and Southwest Onslow. There's going to be about a 60% chance of showers and thunderstorms around about the time the games are getting underway. Some schools, of course, switching and putting their games outside this evening. We've actually got a few thunderstorms locally tonight, too. As we take a look at our live by nine camera, we've seen a lot of sunshine so far today here in Greenville, but now we're starting to see darker clouds clouds edge a little bit closer to us and we actually do have some severe thunderstorm warnings currently in effect now across parts of Duplin County with a line of thunderstorms that extends over into Sampson County also extending over into the southern end of Lenore County. So we'll be monitoring any of these heavier thunderstorms still a good pocket over near Onslow and Jones County. What used to be a severe thunderstorm cluster is now pushing over into western Bertie and Martin County. This cell thankfully has weakened quite a bit but still has at least some modest hail signature showing 
following up with it, so be on the lookout for that. Also, a persistent cluster near the Jones and also Onslow County line is still holding its own from a development standpoint. And here's the latest severe thunderstorm warning for Duplin over into southern Lenore County. And a cold front will arrive tomorrow. First alert weather day is going to continue through Friday evening. Additional strong and severe thunderstorms will be possible with the arrival of that front later tomorrow night. Currently, we're on the hot side of the front. We're at 90 degrees. You'll find rain cooled readings in some locations much hotter where the sun has been more dominant. In some cases, heat indices approaching 110 this afternoon. At least we've had a good breeze circulating. It has been a little gusty from time to time. You see all the different showers and thunderstorms igniting more where that came from because we do have the cold front itself. This will not arrive until later tomorrow evening. So the first part of the day Friday will be dry with a lot of sun and then the front dives in, ignites the showers and thunderstorms late day into the evening tomorrow night. May take until most of Saturday to get the boundary to our south, but cooler air will be filtering in behind it. That cold front is also going to have some bearing on what is trying to happen in the tropics. Of course, Chantal is out there. We're not going to worry about that. It's falling apart a little bit closer to home down near the Bahamas. Some thunderstorms continue to persist, and there are some models that try to develop this system tropically. If it lifts up to the north, the incoming cold front may interact with it. Now, whether or not the front pushes it offshore or allows it to brush along the North Carolina coast for the end of the weekend, that remains yet to be seen. So this is something we need to monitor day to day. You can too with our first alert mobile weather app. Here is your forecast for tonight. Variably cloudy skies, a few dying thunderstorms tomorrow. Variably cloudy again. Additional heat of the day and evening thunderstorms. Some of those could be strong to severe. Your boating forecast sees averaging three to five feet, two to three foot for the sounds. Moderate chop for the lakes and rivers and your inland first alert seven day forecast. 60% chance of rain and storm Saturday. 40% chance Sunday. The bigger story this weekend will be the drop in temperatures will fall back to more autumn like values in the low 80s. Enjoy the cool down. Will do, Jerry. Thanks. Still to come in your news at six, Greenville residents able to speak their minds today concerning potential parking changes in Uptown. We'll have more from today's meeting. Plus, an eight year old CEO, yes, you heard that right, is spreading positivity to young girls through her business. This incredible story and more when we come back. This is WNCT 9 on your side, News at 6. In Greenville, another public meeting on parking took place today at the Shepherd Memorial Library. Residents continued their discussion over raising parking fees in Uptown as well as a potential change in parking. If approved, these fees could be raised to rates of $1.75 an hour with the first hour free. Many residents, though, have differing opinions.
Parking is one of those things where maintaining our parking infrastructure is an expensive part of what the city does. And uh, the proposed fees, uh, at least as I see it, are, are reasonable in light of what other cities are doing and, and what we're currently paying. It depends on the area, but we do not need to make it a barrier and tough for people to come into the area. It needs to be uniform across the uptown area. For more information on these potential changes, visit our website and check out the online original section. Also in the city of Greenville, the city says part of the closed portion of Evans Street and Reed Circle is expected to reopen the first week of September. That intersection shut down on July 29th to relocate a water line. It's part of a larger closure which will continue into September. For more information, including detours set up in the area, head over to WNCT.com. One little girl here in the East isn't just your average eight-year-old. Rylan Kelly is the CEO of her very own business. It's called Jade's Journey, and she's doing something special to bring children from the community together. At the age of six, she started to create bows with scriptures on them after dealing with bullying at school. Two years later, her business is still improving. Now Rylan is seeking out parents and students to gather outside the Pitt County Courthouse on Saturday for a special moment. It's just for all the students to have like a moment of encouragement to just uplift them because now they're going to be going to higher grades, getting difficult homework. Right now, Ryland says Jade's Journey is working on making things for girls who are struggling with health issues to make sure they have accessories available too. Another local business here in Greenville has some exciting news to share. Grover Gaming is among uh, I Inc. Magazine's 38th annual Inc. 5000. That's an exclusive ranking of the nation's fastest growing private companies. The company makes software for charitable gaming, which is legal in various jurisdictions around the country. Since starting in 2013, the company has raised more than $120 million for various charities. We make all the software here, every line of code, every piece of art for these games that raise money for charities. Grover Gaming also wants any programmers in Pitt County area to know they're always looking to hire. For more information, head to our website. All right, coming to out in sports, we've got a little touchdown Thursday for you. Four games move to tonight. You're looking live right now at Northeastern High School up in Elizabeth City. Our Noah Knight checks in on the Conley Vikings opener. Coming up live in sports after this. Now, from the LeakKia.com Sports Desk, it's nine in your side, sports. Last year, Northeastern beat Conley in a high-scoring affair. Tonight, the two hook up again to open up.
brand new season. We've got a little touchdown Thursday tonight with a handful of teams moving their games up a night. Conley made the long trip to Elizabeth City a night early to get that game. And remember last year, the game featured Travion Freshwater against C.J. Johnson. They're both now Pirates. Our Nolan Knight also made the trip north, and he joins us live for a preview. And Nolan, this is a tough road trip for Conley to open up the season. Hey, how's it going, Brian? That's right, a little Thursday night action. A little worried about this storm. The clouds rolled in, but it was beautiful earlier today. And as you mentioned, a high scoring affair last year that Northeastern came out on top of 42 to 34. Northeastern, of course, would go on to the state championship game before losing their first game of the year, while D.H. Conley, they would go on the road for the rest of the season and not lose another game during the regular season. So tonight, they look to make it seven regular season road wins in a row. Can they do it? That's the big question. It should be in a competitive atmosphere out here tonight. As you can see, this players out warming up, getting ready about an hour or so from now from cookout kickoff at this point. So you can kind of start to feel the energy in the air for nine your side sports. I'm Nolan Knight, Brian. Elizabeth City long trip for no one. Of course, he'll have our game of the week coming up tomorrow night. We'll talk about that in just a bit. A little touchdown Thursday coming up tonight. Four games on the schedule as we told you. Conley making the trip north to Elizabeth City to take on Northeastern. Here are the other games coming up tonight. Rocky Mount and Tarboro. And our Ken Watling is going to make the trip there. That's our backyard brawl for Friday night's show. But we'll have highlights of that one for you coming up later on tonight at 11 o'clock. Also for a little touchdown Thursday. Bertie and Riverside. They'll play a night early coming up. Seven Seven o'clock kickoff there in Washington County and Pasquatank. That's also a seven o'clock kick. All the scores and highlights coming up later on tonight. And of course, tomorrow night's the big night, the season debut of Touchdown Friday. Now, we still have to wait a day for the season debut of our show. Our game of the week tomorrow night is a battle in Onslow County. Southwest plays host to Jacksonville to kick off the new football season. The Cardinals rolled in last year's game 40 to 13 over the Stallions on opening night. So obviously, one coach wants a similar game, and the other, quite the opposite. I kind of hope it's the same for us, but um, nah, um, I think it's going to be, a, I mean, they're not as big as they have been up front from what I've heard, but uh, they're still going to be a big group, and they're going to run the ball as we got to be able to stop the run and try to get our, use our speed and get on the outside and make some plays. I hope we can hang with them a little longer than we did last year. You know, we we uh, did a great job of getting up early, and, you know, first, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, you know, our, our kids got a little tired, and it was, you know, it was a hot, humid game, so, you know, we, we had a lot of kids going both ways. And at East Carolina, the Pirates will head into the weekend getting in their final work before game week kicks in next week. Fire coach Mike Houston watched last year's tape from East Carolina's 58-3 loss, and he said it made him sick. We've got to focus on getting better every day. We've got to focus on improving every single day. You know, I sat and I watched last year's game this morning, and it made me absolutely sick to my stomach. And I just... We have got to focus on improving every single day. There are some things on that field last year that are non-negotiable for me. Effort, teamwork, positive enthusiasm, toughness, coming off the ball, tackling. Those are non-negotiable. We are going to do those things. And until we get to where we're doing those things consistently every single day, we're not where we need to be. Every single day, the entire practice has to be the same. There has to be consistency. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to suit up and play. Back with more news for you coming up after this.
Still tracking some big thunderstorms and a severe thunderstorm warning in effect now by the National Weather Service for residents of Duplin and also southern Lenore County. Much more consolidated line of showers and thunderstorms south of the Triangle area. First alert weather day is going to continue through Friday evening. We could see additional thunderstorms with a strong cold front tomorrow. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll have more news coming up tonight at 11. We'll see you then.